Shabbat Shalom, greetings. This uh, time of year, Jews are uh, concentrating on their history and what happened at this season of the year in ancient times and the destruction of uh, two temples and of their ancient capital uh, where they have re returned now, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, but of course, uh, there's no longer a Davidic monarchy ruling, and there's uh, no temple at this point. But we in uh, the Church of God can be inspired when we realize that God's church is, spiritually speaking, a temple. And I want to go to uh, Ephesians, uh, the second chapter, and uh, around verse 20, talking about the church as a, as a spiritual temple. Ephesians 2 and verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Today you're going to be hearing me quote from prophets and apostles. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And he goes on to say, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. You know, there's a story uh, going around that our president uh, here in America, uh, President Trump, is going to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash, uh, going to rebuild uh, the temple. And it'll be uh, ahead of schedule, under budget, and the Palestinians will pay for it. But uh, that's just one, something that's going around on, uh, I guess, on Twitter or wherever. For those of you who are commemorating Bastille Day today, Bastille Day today, uh, I'll take note of that. And uh, there is a city in America, believe it or not, called Kaplan. It's in Louisiana, and evidently in that city they celebrate Bastille Day. I guess they have a French heritage there. And I was looking up that town and found out that the mayor's name is Kirk Champagne. So that that's uh, a good name for the mayor in, in a place where they celebrate Bastille Day. But I would like to go to the uh, writings of the Apostle Paul at first. You know, I just read about how the, uh, we are built on the foundation of the Apostles and Prophets. We understand that we have evidence, great evidence, for God's goodness, for his, first of all, for his reality, that he is, and that also, of course, uh, uh, of his goodness. There, you know, I could go on for the rest of my life on, on those points. But there, but there are some gaps where faith comes into play. And faith is, is, is critically important in, in Christianity because, you know, there are some questions that all of us have and there also are, there are also our intangibles. When we talk about the spirit realm, it's not the same as the physical realm that we can uh, perceive. And so in Romans 1.17, uh, Paul says, uh, uh, let's go on to the... Uh, well, let's go back to verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the good news that we uh, ministers preach. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. We begin uh, with a faith in God and then we build on that. Our faith builds and is strengthened through the years. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And in the original, uh, the just by faith shall live. The just, how? By faith shall live. And uh, actually, since I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go on to Galatians 3.11. And uh, here we see that no matter what you do, you and I are not going to be good enough for what God wants to do for us. It's a matter of the attitude we have. We have to have a converted mind. And that in itself is something that God gives us. And so in, in Galatians 3.11, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. He quotes that again. And now I want to go to Hebrews 10 and verse 38. Hebrews 10 and verse 38. Possibly Paul had something to do with this book, but it doesn't tell us the author, but it's in the style and it's very much like Paul's epistles. And in uh, the 38th verse, 
Now the just shall live by faith. Again, he quotes, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And he once again quotes here. He's quoting from the Septuagint version of the book of Habakkuk. So you see three different places in his writings. He mentions this very important point. You know, Hatzadik bemunato yichyeh, the righteous person in his faith, by his faith, shall live. And uh, he is quoting from the prophet Habakkuk. So today we're going to have a look at Habakkuk. Have a look at Habakkuk. I want to go back to the book of Acts. Again, we find Paul preaching and he warns his listeners in the synagogue. He's in a synagogue here in what is today uh, southwestern Turkey. And uh, in that synagogue, Antioch of Pisidia, he warns them in verse 41 of Acts 13 that they ought, that need to hear with an open mind. They need to be responsive to what he's telling them. Behold, you despiser. Uh, I'm look, a quote, Paul is again quoting Habakkuk. I'm in uh, Acts 13:41. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. <laughs> you're gonna, you're going to be obstinate about this message, but it is the truth. And all of this, he's, you know, these uh, statements that I've read from the Apostle Paul and the author of Hebrews, who may have been Paul or Paulus, or, you know, we can have a long uh, this, this discussion on that. Uh, uh, those verses are coming from Habakkuk. And uh, Habakkuk very likely was a contemporary of Jeremiah, which means that he came after the time of Isaiah and very likely was influenced by Isaiah. I want to go to a couple of verses in Isaiah, or Isaiah, uh, if you are from the UK. And I want to go to uh, Yeshayahu, uh, Isaiah 5 and verse 7. For the vineyard of the eternal of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. I won't read the rest of the verse. It's beautiful poetry, but the point I want to bring out is that here Judah is compared to a pleasant plant. And uh, one of the meanings of Habakkuk, some people believe, is that his name is an Assyrian, based on an Assyrian word for a plant. And he represents God's pleasant plant. He's a prophet uh, originally to the house of Judah. Now he's, of course, a prophet to the world. His material is in the canon, in the Holy Scripture. And now I want to go to Isaiah 11 and verse 9, and a verse that you will see echoed in Habakkuk. This is the millennial vision of Isaiah. Isaiah 11 and verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the eternal as the waters cover the sea. And that, of course, is the key to peace. You know, knowing God's will and doing it is the key to peace and prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, Habakkuk represents, a, a, in, in, fact, an, in fact, an important principle in Jewish tradition. The Jews culturally have wrestled with reality. They have questioned. They have always questioned. They've wrestled with, the, with reality. They've struggled with whatever discipline they have to deal with. And uh, in effect, they go back to the tradition of uh, Je uh, the wrestling of Jacob. So Habakkuk, whose name could be based on the word to embrace, could be considered one who embraces, who comforts, and yes, indeed, he does. But also the meaning of the word could be one who embraces in the sense of one who grapples, one who wrestles. Because Habakkuk, in the Jewish tradition, and helping to establish, establish it in his own writing, seemed to be also wrestling, grappling uh, with reality. There's a story about a Jewish couple. They're at a restaurant, and they're sitting at the table at the restaurant, and the waiter comes over to them and says, is anything okay? See, Jews have a tradition of complaining, and Habakkuk complained, but, and God answered him. And uh, as I said, we, we, uh, Jews struggle with, with reality. They wrestle, they, they ask questions. And I do want to go now uh, to the book of Habakkuk. And uh, it is in the context of Israel, of, of Judah, about to be punished uh, in the Babylonian captivity which this season of the year, of course, is, uh, you know, reminds us of as, as, we, as we read the history of what happened this time of the year. I'm speaking now on the second day of the fifth month. Uh, so uh, 
we see here, uh, I want, I'm going to go through some highlights now from the book of Habakkuk. And <clears throat> I begin here with, with, with what it says in terms of, it calls it the burden, uh, Habakkuk, Habakkuk, you know, the burden of Habakkuk, which the prophet Habakkuk saw. So he had a heavy responsibility. He was given, he, he, he interacted with God, he prayed to God, he got answers, and now he has the responsibility of uh, putting those answers down on, on parchment, uh, one would assume, and then, of course, it's preserved for us. And he saw a tremendous iniquity uh, in his uh, time period, in his uh, nation. And uh, he was thinking, how long can, can this go on? The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O oh, eternal, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you, violence, <clears throat> and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse judgment proceeds. By the way, Habakkuk evidently had, you know, was very influential on Jewish thought in the intertestamental period. The Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, I believe, have found uh, two chapters of Habakkuk with commentary that were preserved for all these centuries as part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Anyway, I'm now in uh, verse um, 5, and here you see the scripture which uh, Paul is, is quoting uh, here in the Masoretic uh, version. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. <laughs> so he says, you're going to be amazed at what's finally going to happen. For indeed, verse 6, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not, that are not theirs. He says, yes, there is a day of reckoning coming. The, the punishment is coming, and I'm going to uh, use the Chaldeans. I'm going to use the Chaldeans to do it. Now we have a new problem. The Chaldeans, they indeed were very cruel and uh, went overboard in, in what they did. It's okay, you're an instrument of punishment, but you're, you know, you're getting, let's say, to use kind of colloquial language, you're getting too much of a kick out of it. You know? so, so God says to him, but I am also going to judge the Chaldeans. I'm going to judge my people, but I'm also going to judge uh, these Gentiles who have been given responsibility to rule over this region. And they also will suffer for their sins. As you know, the Chaldean Empire, the Neo-Babylonian Empire of the Chaldeans, was ultimately conquered by the Medes and the Persians. So I go now to uh, verse uh, 6. Well, now let's go down to verse uh, 8. Okay, uh, 2.8. Uh, I would like to first um, go to earlier in the chapter where, again, Habakkuk is once again complaining. You know, first he complained about his own people's sins, and now he's complaining about the sinful nation that is God is using to punish his people. I will stand my watch. This is the beginning of the second chapter of Habakkuk. I will stand my watch. And, and by the way, speaking of standing my watch, this morning, uh, Daniel and I spoke for the Flair Church, and I'm, glad, I'm grateful for those who've seen that and hope that many of you will, will uh, go ahead on Facebook and see what Daniel and I covered this morning uh, over there for, in the, in, uh, for the Flair congregation. Uh, but anyway, now I'm speaking for the, uh, in the afternoon uh, in the, uh, as, as part of the ministry of the Church of Christian Commandment Keepers. And uh, I want to mention, we have a faithful viewer uh, Marion Snyder Leeson, uh, who's having some health issues. She's having difficulty with her mobility, with the strength in her legs. And so I would ask all of you to please uh, pray for her. Pray for, for Marion and for God to strengthen her and heal her completely. I'm sure she would appreciate that. I want to go now to Habakkuk 2. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. <laughs> so then the eternal answer being said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. You know, so he says, in effect, I, I, I have a schedule. 
I have I have my guidance and direction, my supervision over history, and when it's it's the time for me to act, I will act. You can be sure. Uh, things are going to work out exactly as I've prophesied, right on the schedule that I have set. I want to now uh, continue on to verse 8. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you. Because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. So he says, you're going to have your punishment, you, uh, you Chaldeans, for how you have behaved. And that, of course, indeed uh, took place. Uh, I believe that it's back in Hebrews where that principle is, is brought out again. Yes, I want to go back to Hebrews. I didn't read verse 37, and I should have, because I just read the uh, uh, Habakkuk 2 and verse 3, and it's, it's repeated here in uh, verse 37 of Hebrews, so uh, the 10th chapter. Let's go back there just a moment. Uh, here, uh, the author of Hebrews quotes Habakkuk. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. So, in effect, uh, if we look at the broad sweep of history, uh, we will see that, uh, you know, in, as I said, in, lo in looking at the broad sweep of history, uh, God is going to act. He is going to complete his plan. And moreover, in our own lifetime, we only have, as my son pointed out this morning, we only have so many years to live. We are limited. And ultimately, you know, when we're awakened at, in the resurrection, uh, it will seem just a split, you know, a momentary uh, pause. And then we will have been resurrected at the conclusion of all of these events. And so then he goes on to say, as I've already read, Now the just shall live by faith, or the just by faith shall live. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Now I think another point that this that is being brought out here is that even though it tarries, even though it tarries, you know, once it does, once things do begin to come to a head, once we come to that climactic period in history, it's going to be very rapid because it's a very intense time and unfortunately a, a very tragic time until uh, Jesus Christ comes and, and resolves all, all of these issues. So that time of tribulation, these labor pangs before the birth of the new world, they're going to be very intense. And so once things start to happen, they're going to happen very rapidly. And I think that's another point of that prophecy, that, you know, we're going to have to be patient and, and patient and patient. But then once that generation arrives at the point where, these, uh, where, the, where the climax occurs, it will occur very rapidly. As we understand, there will be a three-and-a-half-year period of, of intense tribulation. The first two, uh, two and a half years uh, is, in effect, where Satan knows he has a short time and he's wreaking havoc on the world. But then that last year is the day, beginning of the day of the Lord when Jesus Christ comes and uh, judges the world and then sets up his kingdom to last for a millennium and then for the great right throne period and then for eternity. So we now go back to uh, Habakkuk 2. And what kind of a world will that be? You see that in the 14th verse, which quotes, you know, which, which I talked about from Isaiah. For the earth will be filled with, the, uh, let's go to verse, uh, well, I'll, I'll read verse 14 right there. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the eternal as the waters cover the sea. The theophany at Sinai was in effect a model, a, a type of the, of the second coming of Christ. And uh, so Habakkuk uses imagery from the Exodus because there's going to be yet a second exodus. God's people will be liberated from captivity uh, at the climax of human history. All the tribes of Israel will be restored uh, to, to the land of Israel. The church itself will go from persecuted to running the world, <laughs> kings and priests and judges. So there'll be a great restoration of physical Israel and spiritual Israel at that time. And so the exodus is a model for that. And so we have here in the third chapter of Habakkuk, he evidently was a Levite and was performing in, in the temple. I referred to the temple earlier. And um, just as Jeremiah was a priest, uh, a prophet and priest, as was Ezekiel, uh, God often uses the family of Levi in that way. He intended to do that. And uh, so here we have Habakkuk who has a psalm here uh, at the conclusion of his book. A, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet on Shig Yonot, so this is a, a way of performing the psalm, and it seems to come from the a word to wander. So it's maybe a very, um, what's the right word, a kind of a wild rhythm, a kind of intense 
uh, with them, uh, not your stately uh, deck, you know, very, uh, what's the right word, not, uh, not a stately kind of minuet, but a rather dramatic, bombastic kind of melody. O Eternal, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Eternal, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. <laughs> Isn't this a prayer that many of us can recite uh, at this time? We really do need a revival of God's work at this time. Now, I suspect when God does revive his work, it will not initially be in an earth-shaking way because many prophetic events have to occur. And I presume if the church is really out there uh, telling the truth in every, in every way, spread all around the world, we will actually be an impediment to certain prophetic events that, that need to occur. So I would imagine, it's just like Paul talked about in Second Thessalonians, that he, his presence evidently was restraining some events that would have to occur after his death. So I would imagine that the impact of the church would restrain certain events that are going to take place. But once things fall into place, and uh, you know the, the the roles are cast as it were for that final dramatic scene, if I can use that kind of analogy, the church will then erupt in great power and great persecution will then fall upon it as we understand. But even before then though, I would expect a revival of the church so that the truth can be preserved, so that the light can continue, so that we can continue to carry the torch to pass it on to that final uh, team of two witnesses. So what I'm expecting to happen is that the first of those two will come on the scene and have perhaps an extended ministry, and as he gets older, then the second one, a younger, more charismatic figure, will join him uh, for the, fin for ne for the uh, final uh, climax of things. But that's speculation on my part. But I'm certainly looking forward to re revival of God's work, and, and I, hope we, I, I, I urge all of us to pray about that, uh, uh, that we can have a more concentrated, authentic preaching and practicing of authentic Christianity. Anyway, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet on Shig Yonoth. O Eternal, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Eternal, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. So here we see God coming, in effect, from the uh, Edomite region and into the Sinai region. Uh, you know, as I said, it's a, it's a kind of... Uh, it's a reference to the theophany at Sinai as a type of of the of the uh, second coming of Christ, and it may, may very well it may very well be that God's people in the end time, at least some element of them, will be in a place of protection in what is today uh, Jordan and perhaps over spilling over into the Sinai region and maybe even over into the Negev region. So I'm going to read verse 3. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light he had rays flashing from his hand, and there, was and there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence and fever followed at his feet. We, we remember that God delivered the Israelites with, with uh, great uh, plagues upon Egypt. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. This kind of reminds me of Psalm 114. And we talk now about Midian, which was in that region. Remember, Jethro was from that region. Zipporah was from that region. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. So Kushan is a term relating to Midian. O Eternal, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? You know, he plagued the Nile River. He split the Red Sea. Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. Selah. Of course, he came and delivered his people and gave them a covenant at Sinai. You do, um, uh, let me just read the whole verse. So, well, Selah means that now we have uh, a musical interlude while we're meditating on what was said, and, a, and we have a crescendo, evidently. And then, then the rest of the verse reads, You divided the earth with rivers. You know, speaking about the acts of creation and the miraculous acts around the Exodus and in the future. <clears throat> uh, so uh, I see that uh, I think I can continue with this chapter. 
The mountain saw you and trembled. The, the overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows, they went. At the shining of your glittering spear. This also reminds me of the miracle of Joshua's long day, which I can get into at another time. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for, the, for salvation with your anointed. Yes, the anointed is coming. Uh, you know, God chose Moses and Aaron in those days, and Moses to be the civil leader and Aaron to be the high priest. But ultimately, we have the anointed. We have the Messiah, Mashiach, Christos, the Christ, who is not only the Messiah, but also the Savior. In fact, God himself, and you know, uh, uh, Davidic and divine, the word uh, returning. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by, by laying bare from foundation to neck. Selah. Once again, think about all this. You thrust through with his own arrows the head of the villages of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses through the heap of great waters. So there were those who, who sought to perse persecute and oppress Israel, and they were dealt with, and in the future too, those who will oppress the modern descendants of Israel and the church will ultimately be judged. When I heard, and, and it's going to be such an intense judgment that it is scary to talk about it, and, and it's scary, it was scary to Habakkuk. When I heard my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. So knowing that, in rough times, we have that comfort. And so uh, Habakkuk was going to be going through some rough times of his own, but he realized ultimately what, uh, what would uh, come in the future, the future redemption. And uh, so even in those rough times, he had faith. Uh, as we read earlier, uh, we live by faith. And there are a lot of scriptures on faith I could have read, but I read several that were based on the, on the writings of, of Habakkuk. So yes, a tribulation is coming on the world, but it will be then followed by that wonderful world tomorrow, that awesome age ahead, that millennium and great right throne judgment period and beyond. And so Habakkuk says, <clears throat> though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fall, may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the eternal, I will joy in the God of my salvation. A very powerful statement of faith from Habakkuk. And he concludes in a psalmist style, the Lord eternal is my strength. Let's, let's, do it, uh, let's do it another way. He says, the eternal God is my strength. That's what's here. The eternal God is my strength. Um, uh, well, let's, let's look at, actually, the Hebrew here is Yahweh Adonai. So the eternal Lord is my strength, okay? The eternal Lord is my strength. Perhaps the NIV translates it, the sovereign Lord. Okay, so Yahweh Adonai, the eternal Lord, is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet or like gazelle's feet. Like, like once some translation uses the, the older word hind. He will make my feet like, like a hind's feet, and he will make me walk on my high heels. So I'll be scampering, I'll be jumping, I'll be running. He will give me energy to finish the race to swiftly finish the race, to successfully finish the race, to be, to be able to run up high, walk, to uh, walk on, on high hills, to triumph, to the chief musician, which also means to the overcomer, with my stringed instruments. So here uh, Habakkuk will perform this beautiful hymn and in a very positive manner. God is going to energize us, he's going to give us the victory, and he's going to cause us to win the race. And, and to, to run as, as swift as, as, as uh, these light-footed light and graceful animals referred to here. And so let's finish by what, with the, what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7. Again, building on this thought uh, in, in Habakkuk. Paul says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So... Paul was very much influenced by, I believe, these prophecies uh, uh, that I've read some of and some 
I had skipped over, but you, you could read the entire book. And uh, I hope and pray that you have benefited by having a look. We have, we've had a look at Habakkuk. And I hope and pray you've benefited from uh, these, uh, looking at these prophecies and tying them in uh, with the writings of the New Testament. Indeed, we can look forward to ultimate victory, even though we know at some point in history there is coming a time of tribulation, but beyond it is coming a time of great peace, prosperity, and liberation for humankind. And it's, for, it's up to us to maintain that faith in God's word uh, and to maintain our our relationship with him that we may be a part of the solution ultimately so i want to as i conclude look forward beyond this uh, hot summer you know to the cooler refreshing autumn season and to the uh, particularly those eight days when we'll be god willing feasting together in the hills of tennessee and inviting you to come uh, with us at that time but in the meantime all the best to you and yours